We turn now to 1 Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. One of the mistakes that people think make is to think that godliness is of profit only for the life to come. Now notice in 1 Timothy 4, 8 that Paul says very clearly, that godliness is profitable not only for the life to come, but also for this life itself, for this present life. And this is a trustworthy statement, he says in verse 9, and deserving wholehearted acceptance from all people all over the world. That when we seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, we are not only blessed in the future life, but we are blessed in this life also. We know that physical exercise has helped in this life. It has profit. It blesses us. But godliness also has spiritual profit that affects our whole being in this life too. For example, the one who lives a godly life would live a life free from anxiety. And that frees him from many inner tensions, gives him good sleep at night, and frees him from many sicknesses and diseases. The man who lives a godly life would be free from bitterness and having grudges against people and an unforgiving spirit and hatred and many things like that that can cause diseases in the body too. Likewise, the man who lives a godly life would be frugal, would avoid bad habits and wasteful expenditure, and so he finds that he has enough to make both ends meet. And he probably earns more because God blesses his labors. And so there is a profit in this life itself. It doesn't mean that we will be millionaires. But we will not only have enough for ourselves, but we will have enough to share with others who are in need. And so you see, godliness is not just for the future life. It is very clearly written in 1 Timothy 4, 8. It holds promise for the present life. For this life, there is a blessing. The one who seeks the kingdom of God first and his righteousness will find all the other things added to him. How wonderful it is here in this earth, in this world, to live a life completely free from depression. Is that a blessing or not? It certainly is. And it is the result of disciplining oneself to godliness. To be free from anxiety. To, pre to be free from bad moods and from depression. And from losing one's temper. And from being offended. And getting discouraged. And gloomy. These are the blessings that we have here in this life. And then in the life to come. We have the hope of sharing the glory of the Lord Jesus and of living before the face of the Father and enjoying the rapture of that experience for all eternity. And so the wise person is the one who pursues after godliness and who disciplines his life to obey the commandments of God to live a godly life. This is a trustworthy statement, 1 Timothy 4.9 and it deserves full acceptance by all people. And it is for this, verse 10, Paul says, that we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Why is it that Paul labored and strived? Because, he says in verse 10, it is for this that we labor and strive. Because he knew that godliness was the only worthwhile thing, both in this world and in the world to come. 
So obviously, if that is true, the only sensible thing any person can live for is for godliness. And that's why Paul writes so much about godliness in these three letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. These were Paul's letters to Christian leaders, the only letters that we have in the New Testament specifically written to Christian leaders, apart from the seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. These three letters of Paul to Timothy and Titus. And in these letters he speaks much about godliness and much about sound doctrine. And his whole aim in these letters, and particularly in 1 Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy 3.15, I'm writing these things so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the church of God, and 1 Timothy 4.6, how to be a good servant of Christ Jesus. If you are in a position of ministry or in Christian leadership, whether as a layman or as a full-time worker, it doesn't make a difference. These letters are especially and specifically applicable to you. How you can be a good servant of Christ Jesus and how you are to teach other people how everyone is to conduct himself in the church of the living God. Pursue after godliness is the exhortation to Christian leaders. Discipline yourself, train yourself to live a godly life. He doesn't say spend much time preparing your sermons. There's not a word in these letters about the amount of time you should spend in preparing your sermons. Unfortunately, many preachers spend more time in preparing sermons than in disciplining themselves to godliness. And this is why the inner life of many preachers is pretty impure. And therefore they are not good servants of Christ Jesus. Paul's emphasis is discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And he's done that himself. He says in 1 Timothy 4.10, It is for this we labor and strive. Because he says, We have fixed our hope on the living God. We know that God's word as revealed to us in Christ and through the apostles are God's direction for our earthly life. He knows what is best for us. And it's clear that if we obey his commandments, we will be blessed in this life and in the life to come. We have fixed our hope on the living God who has revealed his word to us in this way. And this living God is the savior of all men. There's a sense in which God is the preserver maintainer and deliverer, as it says in the Amplified New Testament, the expanded meaning of Savior, of all men. God preserves people all over the world from many diseases, accidents, and blesses people in so many ways, provides them with food and health and sunlight and rain and so many things. Jesus said he makes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust, sends rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. In that sense, he's the savior of all men, preserving them from the floods of demonic and satanic attack in many ways. But especially, he is the savior of those who believe. In the sense that those who have come to faith in Christ have known him not only as a preserver and a savior in these material ways, but have known that eternal salvation of the soul through Christ Jesus. This is the meaning of 1 Timothy 4.10. The living God. Now Jesus Christ is not the Savior of all men. He doesn't say that in Scripture. Jesus Christ, we are told in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, is the one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. But here he's speaking about God himself preserving and maintaining and delivering people from many calamities and blessing them with many earthly blessings so that they may turn and find salvation in Christ. Paul spoke about that in Acts chapter 17 when he was speaking in Athens. He pointed out that it was God who gave them their seasons and blessed them in so many ways. In Acts chapter 14 too, when he was speaking to the heathen, he said, God has not left himself without a witness. He's given us the various seasons, the rain and the sun and so many things. All these are with the purpose that we might 
seek him and find him so that we can find not only blessing but also salvation in Christ Jesus. Acts 14, 17. God did not leave himself without a witness. He did good to you. He gave you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. In this sense, God is the Savior and Deliverer of all men. But the purpose of all this is so that men may seek him and find him, as he says in Acts 17 and verse 27, that they should seek God, that they might grope for him and find him, and thus find salvation in Christ. We see here in 1 Timothy 4.11, again Paul emphasizes to Timothy, prescribe and teach these things, or keep commanding and teaching these things. It is important, he says, that we make it clear to all to whom we preach, that godliness is the very best thing we can pursue for this life and for the life to come. 